The desired player skill set in the NBA has changed a lot over the years, so in today's video, we're going to be looking at 10 players that were born in the wrong era. So if you guys like my content, make sure you like and subscribe. On the last video, we got an insane 17,000 likes, so if we could beat that, that would be absolutely ridiculous. And let's hop right into it. Real quick, I want to talk to you about today's sponsor, Swagbucks. If you want to earn cash or gift cards, maybe you need some VC to upgrade your 2K player, Swagbucks is the place for you. I've used it and it's pretty simple. By watching videos, playing games, taking surveys, or even shopping online, you earn rewards. If you guys want to try out Swagbucks, click the link in the description below and get an extra $5 bonus when you take your first survey. Thank you Swagbucks for sponsoring the video and let's hop back into it. The NBA has changed so much over the years. Not too long ago, teams were sending around back to the basket in isolation play. Now the NBA is played at a high pace, broken down by analytics and centered around the three-point shot. The three-pointer has only been in existence since 1979, and now we have teams like the Houston Rockets who take more threes than shots within the perimeter. Now there is a lot that has contributed to this, like rule changes such as hand checking, the rising popularity of the sport, which has brought in a bigger pool of athletes, and like we mentioned before, analytics. So in this video, we're going to be looking at players with a varying success in the league. Some are role players that have put in a different era would most likely be stars, and some are top players in the NBA today, but have a skill set more suited for a different era. Now I want to make this clear for the video, we are not taking into consideration money. Obviously teams and player salaries are much, much higher than they ever were, so we're going based solely on on-court performance. And with all that being said, we're going to start it off with former third overall pick, Jaleel Okafor. Okafor was the number one player in high school back in 2014 and went to Duke where as a 6'10 freshman averaged 17 points shooting 66% from the field and led Duke to an NCAA championship. Going into that 2014 NBA draft, he was a top prospect with his frame, college success, and skill as an interior scorer. Even at the time of the draft, there were concerns about Okafor in terms of his defense, effort, and if his skill set was suited for the modern NBA. These concerns would allow guys like D'Angelo Russell and a less productive Carl Anthony Towns to go ahead of him in the draft. Jaleel Okafor's postgame would translate early on in his career, as in his rookie season, he would average 17 points, 7 rebounds, shooting over 50% from the field. But the concerns with Okafor coming out of college became very evident with his subpar defense, obvious lack of effort, and his one-dimensional offensive game that wasn't valued in the new direction of the league so in just his third season, he would completely fall out of the rotation for the 76ers. To get an idea of how low his value was at the time, he got traded to the Brooklyn Nets alongside Nick Stauskas for Trevor Booker, who averaged less than 7 points on his career and would only last 33 games on the 76ers. Now this past season, Okafor has had a slight comeback on the New Orleans Pelicans, but he's still clearly one of the biggest busts currently in the league. Luckily for Okafor, he came in just soon enough to get that top pick salary, but playing in the 90s or early 2000s, he would have most likely been a top center in this league. Now, there's nothing wrong today with being a great player in the post, but you have to bring something more to the table. Carl Anthony Towns can spread the floor at an elite level. Joel Embiid is one of the best defenders in the league. Okafor's lack of physicality, pick and roll defense, and floor spacing makes it hard to have him on the court. The NBA evolved too quick for Okafor, but I hope he can turn things around and solidify himself in this league. Next, we got Reggie Miller, who's one of the greatest shooters in NBA history. His play style was way ahead of his time. During his prime, teams were taking on average around 7 to 16 threes, depending on what season you're looking at. Now, teams are taking on average 32 threes a game, with teams such as the Houston Rockets taking as much as 40. Five. So with this massive increase in three-point volume and today's game played at a much higher pace, I think Miller would most likely have a lot more shot opportunities. In 1997, he was third in three-point attempts, but by far the most efficient at 43% out of anyone close to his volume. Because of his size and elite shooting, it's hard to imagine that Miller wouldn't succeed in today's three-point oriented league. Miller was a great player in his era as he averaged 18 points per game, shooting 47% from the field and 40% from three. Reggie Miller's work ethic, especially when it came to his shooting, is what makes me so confident he would thrive in today's game. As former teammate Fred Hoiberg said, I like to be the first one in the gym, but regardless of what time I got there, he was already there. That's what made him one of the game's best three-point shooters. He was there before the lights even came on. That showed me how hard I needed to work. Reggie Miller was a competitor. He was one of the most well-known trash talkers in NBA history. So I think in today's less physical league, as a 6'7 knockdown shooter, Miller would definitely experience a lot of success. Next, we got Andrew Wiggins, who just like Jaleel Okafor, was the number one ranked player in high school and was given some of the most hype and high expectations we have ever seen. Leading up to his freshman season at Kansas, he was actually on the cover of Sports Illustrated and at the time was getting comparisons like Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant to become the next hyper-athletic wing 
wing who can take over the league on both ends. Wiggins had a solid freshman season where he averaged 17 points, shooting 45% from the field and 35% from three. And while there was some debate on whether him or Jabari Parker would be that number one overall pick, the Cleveland Cavaliers decided to go with Wiggins. Now, he would end up getting traded to the Minnesota Timberwolves before the beginning of his rookie year. It would have a solid season where he got 17 points per game and ended up bringing home the Rookie of the Year award. Wiggins would continue to progress all the way to his third season where he averaged almost 24 points, shooting 45% from the field and 36% from three. But since then, after taking a new role as the third option behind Carl Anthony Towns and Jimmy Butler, it hasn't been great for Wiggins and he's become one of the most torn apart players in the league when it comes to the online NBA community. Wiggins has looked solid when he has one thing to do, and that's score the ball, but he really doesn't fit in any modern day system. He is nowhere near the defender we expected coming out of college. He's not much of a playmaker and struggles with efficiency, especially when it comes to his three-point shot. Now, right now, he is young at 23 years old and has time to progress and reach that potential we saw, but if placed in a different era, especially the early 2000s, I think we would already be talking about Wiggins as a top player in the league. At the time, the three-point shot wasn't nearly as necessary, and it was a very isolation-based game where he would fit in perfectly. His combination of amazing athleticism attacking the rim and a solid back-to-the-basket game would be embraced. Obviously, we don't know this for sure, but comparing today's game to back then, it's a pretty fair assumption. Next, we have Andre Karolinko, one of the most versatile defenders of all time. Karolinko was called a Swiss Army Knight for a reason. He was able to guard practically every position at 6'9 with a 7'4 wingspan, but had enough lateral quickness to keep up with top guards, which is perfect for today's switch-heavy defense. He's one of the best help defenders we have ever seen. Despite playing mostly at the small forward spot, he averaged 1.8 blocks a game on his career and led the league in blocks back in 2005 with 3.3 a game. This is on top of his career average of 1.4 steals. Andre Kirilenko will receive a lot more praise in today's game, similar to what we've seen with Draymond Green, but brings a lot more offensively to the table. He is the offensive skill set of a point forward with solid ball handling and playmaking at his position. In his prime, he was averaging right around 16 points per game, shooting 45 plus percent from the field. Now, he was never much of a three point threat, but at times in his career, he had low volume but decent efficiency seasons. If he was born in today's game, obviously with a bigger focus on the ability to shoot beyond the arc, I think he would be a decent floor spacer. So, we're talking about a six foot nine point forward who can switch on practically any matchup, but also has the length to be one of the league's best shot blockers while being not a great floor spacer, but one that's definitely not a liability. In terms of what you want to see today, it doesn't get much better than Andre Karolinko. Next, we got Russell Westbrook, who's one of the league's best point guards, but his play style isn't ideal for today's game, especially in terms of winning a championship. When a team is fully built around Westbrook, he's a perfect player to make you a decent team, maybe even pop into the playoffs, but the ceiling of a Westbrook-led team isn't very high. A lot of this stems from his inability to shoot at a consistent level. He's a career less than 31% three-point shooter, and over the past two seasons has failed to even shoot 30% from three and has regressed as a free throw shooter. Yes, he stuffs the stat sheet, averaging triple doubles over the past three seasons, but his rebounding numbers are clearly inflated with Steven Adams' willingness to give up defensive rebounds so he can push the ball up the court. And while he's averaging over 10 assists a game, he is far from being one of the league's best playmakers. He can be a solid defender when he wants, but that's a rare sight, so I'm really not sure where he's going to fit into a Houston Rockets team that it's taking more threes than inside shots. But with all that said, Westbrook would have dominated in most any era, putting him in the 60s to 80s, where we saw some of the highest pace. Teams were scoring on average well over 110 points per game, but still hadn't even seen a three-point shot implemented. It's almost a guarantee Westbrook would have taken the league by storm. His speed, explosiveness, and ability to take the ball coast to coast would have been unmatched at the time, and he would most likely stub the stat sheet like we see today, and like we saw with Oscar Robertson in that era. Next, we got Pedro Stojakovic, who's one of the best shooters we have ever seen. At 6'9", he was a career over 40% shooter, taking 5.5 a game. His quick release and knockdown shot would have easily translated in today's game, but with the small ball era, he might have even experienced more success as a stretch four. He was never a great defender, but his shooting is more than enough to keep him on the court in today's league. Next, we have DeMar DeRozan and Lamarcus Aldridge, who actually play on the same team in the San Antonio Spurs. It's a pretty interesting duo as while their playstyle isn't ideal for the modern NBA, but in the early 2000s, they would have been a dream of a duo. Now, Aldridge did begin his career in the mid-2000s, but I would have loved to see him begin in the 90s and have his prime in that early 2000s period. 
Aldridge is one of the most lethal post scorers we have ever seen. He's an amazing combination of back to the basket and knockdown mid range shooting. To have him alongside one of the best scoring wings inside the arc in DeMar DeRozan, it would have been lethal. DeRozan's athleticism makes him a top player going at the rim, but his most common spot is to score in that 16 feet to 3 point area. He has tried to adapt to the modern 3 point game, but it hasn't really worked as his best shooting season was only 31% from 3, but if put in practically any other era, I think this duo would have been feared. Lastly, we have one of the most obvious ones, and that's going to be Ben Simmons. Simmons has emerged as one of the top young players in the league and just received a massive contract extension from the 76ers, but there's one thing holding both him and his team's potential success back, and that's his inability to shoot. Now, we've been talking about a lot of players' lack of shooting in this video, but no one, especially out of the guards, compares to Ben Simmons. Over the past two seasons, he's only attempted 17 threes, where he's made a big whopping zero and it doesn't get any better when it comes to his mid-range jumper, as in a very small sample size, he shoots less than 30% from 16 feet to the outside arc, and well over 80% of his shots are coming within 10 feet. Now with this said, Ben Simmons is a great player from practically every other aspect. He's a 6'11 point guard who averaged 17 points, 8 assists, and 9 rebounds. If you put him in an arrow like the 80s, Ben Simmons would be battling with another oversized point guard who is commonly deemed the greatest point guard of all time in Magic Johnson for that top point guard in the league spot. Now we're seeing these videos of Ben Simmons hitting jump shots in these offseason pickup games, but let's be honest here, Ben Simmons isn't going to be pulling up from deep on a consistent basis anytime soon, if ever, so it really looks like he was just born in the wrong era. That's the end of the video guys, I want to know your thoughts in the comments below, yes, there's a lot more guys you can put in the video, but these are the guys we're going with for now, if you like the video, make sure you like and subscribe, and the shoutouts are gonna be... Justin Bird, Nick Slavin, Jack Gladiator, Alexander Shelton, and Brogue Nation. If you guys want to shout out in the next video, all you gotta do is like the video and comment liked or rep notification gang, and I'll shout five of you guys out. With all being said, hope you guys have a great day, and peace.